So uh, now uh, we are representing the Euromedia Publishing Group that uh, in our main goal to provide the state-of-the-art scientific information from the International Neurological Meeting for Russian Neurologists. As you know, it's a big problem for Russian Neurologists to attend such uh, meeting like this because of long distance and uh, comparable expensive uh, for Russian Neurologists. So, uh, you are a well-known specialist in Russia, as I know you uh, attended Russia twice. So you known the specialists in andrology and uh, in other uh, parts of urology. And according to this, I have uh, some, first of all, some personal question for you. So uh, today the most important uh, urological meeting in Europe, maybe in the whole world. So what role this Congress plays in the life of European urologists? I think uh, that uh, this Congress is a central scientific Congress for urologists in Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's also attended by Americans and by Arabians because they don't want to go to the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally, uh, from my department, for example, I'm coming from Germany, uh, all good papers are submitted to European urology and everybody is interested to uh, have a poster or a lecture here. So it's a very, very important Congress. And uh, what is more, it's, uh, what is the most uh, important, the information or coordination or just the meeting? At first, I think it's the information and then also it's the discussion with other uh, researchers concerning mm -hmm. the same topic. What is the level of your research? Is it really interesting? Are the results debatable and all these things? And I think there's a good platform here. And uh, what role the Congress play in, plays in your life? In my life? Personally, yeah. Well, I was educated with the German and American Congress. And then in the 19th of the last uh, century, the European urology uh, grew, grew up. And then mm -hmm. the first time I attended it was 1980. The second time in, in 1992. And then I came to all the Congresses mm -hmm. since this time. So I'm a regular guest and speaker and moderator and so. Okay, what scientific trends uh, of this Congress can you name? I think we have uh, uh, new translational trends, molecular medicine, molecular imaging for cancer. Mm -hmm. And we discussed also the future of laparoscopic and robotic surgery. And uh, we have new trends uh, for stem cell activation for urethral slings and male incontinence. Uh, functional MRI is one topic. And in my special field of interest, I think it's especially um, molecular and logical um, items as uh, the type of fertilization parameters of sperm and uh, what is the limitation of fertilization of the egg and all these things. And what perspective in the, is the most important in your opinion? I mean, uh, you don't think that, you don't feel that too much cancer in these uh, meetings? In these no, I do not know. I do not think so because cancer is very important. Also BPH is a very important thing here. Yeah. But cancer is very important and uh, it must play a import an, a, an important role. I think the key thing is that the other areas are not suppressed by cancer. Mm -hmm. If they are not uh, <coughs> notable and, no, uh, and you cannot de detect these other areas, then it's bad. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the ARU tries to balance it out. Mm -hmm. So, some words about your hospital. In what field of urology is uh, closely, the mostly specialized in? Our university hospital 
covers all types of urology, pediatric urology and endrology. Exclusion is renal transplantation because we have the department for transplantation and we are doing only um, revision operations for the ureter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you perform surgical procedures regularly? Yes, all the days. Mm, good. And what type of surgery do you prefer? Maybe endoscopic, laparoscopic, maybe robotic assisted? I'm trained in open surgery and in uh, percutaneous surgery and especially also in endoscopic surgery. I'm also trained in laparoscopic surgery and in microsurgery. But when I became head of our department, I uh, decided not to continue with microsurgery because um, it is too time extended. So I have a specialist for this, he's doing mm -hmm. it in my department. And laparoscopic uh, surgery is in my department, especially subunit. I have some guys mm -hmm. who are doing only laparoscopy and now we try to get a roboter and then we will start with this also. Uh, should the surgeon uh, get and uh, separate additional certificates maybe to perform the laparoscopic for example? I think so. Uh, we have now the European Society a uh, new education trail and you can, can apply as a resident for a laparoscopic and robotic surgical training for six months. Mm. So, if, for example, if I not, don't have this certificate... You can get can to a different department and you can be trained in, a three, se in three area periods. Three months, first basis, laparoscopic, animal training and all the things. We have also a laparoscopic training unit in our department. But then for robotics you can go also to a center mm -hmm. and you can assist there for robotic operations. No. Okay. So, and some uh, clinical questions. Uh, what is the inflammation role in antispermal antibodies development? So, uh, could um, the inflammations uh, lead to this condition? I do not believe in this interaction. We published a big study two years ago in, uh, in uh, European Urology and demonstrating that neither prostatitis nor epididymitis nor male accessory gland infection inflammation mm -hmm. does play any role for sperm antibody formation. So I do not believe in this. Uh, maybe you have heard about them. Uh, this issue that uh, the chronic prostatitis is uh, linked with the prostate cancer. This is a hypothesis. Only hypothesis. It's a. Uh, Animal, it's a hypothesis based on animal data and there are no clinical data until now. Mm -hmm. So you know there's a post-inflammatory atrophy and prostatic biopsies and this lesion is discussed as a precursor of prostatic cancer but there are no biopsy studies demonstrating this association. But I think there must be an association but it's not really confirmed for humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next uh, question, uh, what is your opinion about the role of circumcision in the uh, human immunodeficit virus uh, it's prevention? Good. So it's a good question, yeah, it's a good question. We know that circumcision, especially in Africa, mm -hmm. prevents infection with HIV virus because HIV virus attaches the inner part, the inner part of the prepucium mm -hmm. and if this circumcised there are no receptors for the HIV virus and you can reduce, I think, the infection rate in a percentage of about 30%. But this is not reconfirmed for white people and it's not reconfirmed for homosexual people. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's uh, only, it's a good hint, but not really confirmed. So we do not counsel our younger men to have, uh, to undergo a circumcision. But furthermore, it's a protection against herpes virus type 2 and also for papilloma virus mm -hmm. infection. You know this. So we do, no, nowadays we don't have a large uh, studies to confirm this, yes? As I, understand. I think it's necessary to do it also for white uh, people in Europe. Okay, so <coughs> about varicocele. Uh, varicocelectomy as a pathospermia prevention in men with no pain and normal quality of sperm. What do you think? We, uh, the European Association and the guideline committee does not suggest to do a protective vacuoselectomy or vacuocele therapy in these cases. 
-hmm. only in adolescence. But in adolescence, you think it's uh, yeah, there's a new uh, meta-analysis published this year, and they are demonstrate they do demonstrate that if you have a 20% reduction of the testicular volume in the side where the varicocele is present, mm -hmm. in comparison to the other side, if you're doing a microsurgical, for example, micro uh, vicosalectomy, mm -hmm. then the volume is recovering the same volume as the other side. So this is protective. Uh, but uh, if we <coughs> don't have the uh, decreasing the volume of testes, ipsilateral testes. There's no in indication for adults for a protective reason. You can do it for aesthetic reasons, mm -hmm. for pain, mm -hmm. and, and of course for bad sperm quality. Mm -hmm. But not protective at the moment. It's only a meaning, it's an of expert course. meaning. Yeah. So, what is the role of infection? Uh, what the role infection plays in the abacterial prostatitis? You know that the um, uh, antibiotics is uh, suggested to use uh, even in the abacterial prostatitis. Yeah. So, how this, you can this explain? It's also it? a good question, and uh, um, we define the non-bacterial prostatitis now as inflammatory, non-infectious pelvic pain syndrome (NIH3A) and the <coughs> uh, suggestions of the consensus group in Paris and also the suggestion of the ARU guideline group are not to treat mm -hmm. these patients blindly with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there, uh, we discussed it uh, already, so are there something new in the ED treatment um, we should Wait yeah. in recent years. I, we had yesterday a meeting of the yeah. European section of andrology, your, uh, andrological urology, and we had a very nice talk of Dr. Fuss so from Naples, and referred and he referred to a new study uh, done in the United States, and they are doing microstats in the arteria pudenda uh -huh. via arteriography. It was a cardiac group. They treated erectile dysfunction in urological patients with microstents, uh, with drug eluting microstents. Mm -hmm. And they went down until the basis of the penis. And in 50% of these patients, they had a uh, <coughs> recovering of erectile function. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely new. <laughs> yeah, and what about pharmaceutical? Uh, uh, there ma there, there's coming up a new substance, a new uh, five fossil, uh, five, uh, new yeah. five fossil dose inhibitor. It's coming from the United States, uh, but nothing really new. Yeah. Um, what about uh, excluding except uh, PD5 inhibitors? Yes. Maybe. No. And several years ago, this was discussed uh, the red model, uh, in vitro model, uh, that uh, the H2S. Uh, make a sense uh, in the erectile dysfunction pathogenesis, not an old pathway, but H2S. Yes, yes, pathway. we discussed it, but I think it's not really reconfirmed. But yeah. there was also a study published here uh, demonstrated ejecting stem cells after denervation of the erectile function nerve. So it may be a new way, but it's only uh, preclinical. It's not uh, something to do clinically, mm -hmm. but this was a stance. This is, we can yeah. do it, yeah, questionable. We can do a study or so. Uh, what about uh, the extracorporeal shockwave therapy? For in what? The, for, for erectile dysfunction. So. <laughs> Even in this exhibition, uh, several yeah. companies uh, provide we did, these We did uh, extracorporeal shockwave therapy in Pioneer's disease. We did some studies on this, and there's only one study uh, by uh, the, the Naples group demonstrating that the combination of this therapy with Cialis, for example, in the mm -hmm. evening improves the erectile function. But I think uh, these are preliminary results and they have to be reconfirmed. Mm -hmm. And what about the using this method in, in other conditions, for example, uh, chronic pelvic pain syndrome or uh, Peyronie's disease? There's one, uh, so Peyronie's disease, we have uh, one blinded uh, study demonstrating no effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, so we have, everybody has finished it, but in uh, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, there's one study by from, uh, from Salzburg, uh, I think from Salzburg, demonstrating that the effect, but there's a 
major criticism because the blinded group mm -hmm. yeah, had no effect. And normally everybody has an effect of a reduction of the pain score in 25%. So if you are drinking water and you have a pelvic pain syndrome, you are blinded and you think mm -hmm. there's a veil room inside, you have a reduction of your pain score of about 25%. And these guys under placebo had no reduction. So we think that the study is not really good. Mm -hmm. yes. And what about That's my personal, of course. my personal meaning. Of course. Uh, what about herbal medicines? Yeah, herbal medicines I think are coming because especially as uh, anti-infectious agents, we learned that the resistance against antibiotics is increasing, increasing and increasing. And we learned from studies that, that for example, if you are drinking a lot, in 50% of cystitis patients in women, acute cystitis, mm -hmm. an antibiotic therapy is not necessary. After six days, they are free of symptoms. And it's a new study. Mm -hmm. And there's one substance, canephron, uh, canephron, you know it. Yes. And uh, they want to do now a prospective study. Uh, I do not know whether it's all also done in, in Russia, but they will do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think um, uh, phytos are coming, especially in the anti-infectious field, because we have too many resistance uh, for not so heavy entities. Mm -hmm. And uh, additionally, in the cystitis uh, area, so what tactic do you use uh, in the recurrent chronic cystitis in women? Or you are yeah, we, we are doing, no, no, we are doing first, we are doing antibiotic therapy for sterilization of the urine. Mm -hmm. And in premenopausal women, we are putting them, for example, on low dose of litophorantoin 50 milligram per day in the evening for six months on trimetoprim. And then we have the possibility to give them immune stimulation with ovaxome as a special mm -hmm. substance or uh, injection. And uh, then they're drinking also cranberry juice to reduce uh, adherence of the bacteria to the ur epithelia. And uh, my patients are, have all um, uh, pills in the pocket. And if mm -hmm. they have sexual intercourse, mm -hmm. they, uh, they have one pill before. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, fluorochinolone, and uh, this is preventing uh, the infection of the female vagina and then of the urethra. That's the best way to do it, I think. pre prophylaxis is the term. Yeah, and what about prophylaxis? Uh, when we use the low-dose prophylaxis yes. of cystitis, uh, could we uh, grow up the resistant bacteria? Not with nitrofontoin. Mm -hmm. I think uh, prophylaxis with uh, fluoroquinolone is obsolete in, in, in nowadays. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, peyronie diseases, treatment tactics have been changed several times. Peyronie uh, diseases? Peyronie yeah. So, uh, what cornerstone points uh, can you name nowadays? So the first, I think, uh, in the inflammatory phase, the patients are suffering from pain mm -hmm. in the penis. And this time you cannot operate them, because then it, be it becomes worse. Yeah. So the patient will ask, when the pain is ceasing, and then normally it ceases after six to 12 months. And if you want, you can give them potaba for mm -hmm. prevention of a, for, uh, of a deterioration of the curvature. And uh, some of them are, want to have care for their penile lengths, and then we are putting them on um, a penile stretcher or vacuum device. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, in my patients, they are private patients, they are put also on um, five uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor, for example, Cialis 5 milligram in the evening to activate the muscle structure in the corpora cavernosa. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is uh, lengthening the penis. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, uh, I think, the best tactic. We, we discussed it yesterday, I think we have no other tactics for this. And should we look toward to excision of plaque or the next procedure is enough? Um, the guideline group does not suggest the excision of the plaque. If the penile is length, we are doing a plication or mm -hmm. a nesbit or a modified nesbit, jachia or uh, another other technique. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if the penis is short, 
we are doing an incision of the plaque and at the maximum of the ingulation we are extracting it a little bit for two centimeters and then we are putting a sheet of graft inside vein and we are doing we are preferring uh, tutu patch it's a lyophilized bovine pericard mm -hmm. it's without antigens and bacteria and then the patients and that's the problem with all grafting techniques is that the penal length is shrinking Mm -hmm. So all the patients have to be put afterwards on six months vacuum device and on five phosphodiurase inhibitors. It's very expensive. Yeah. So, so uh, andrology in Germany is a subspecialty or mm. it's a separate specialty? No, no, it's a subspecialty of urology. Mm -hmm. How? Uh, so, uh, for example, if I want to be an andrologist in Germany, uh, should I? I finish uh, the residency in urology and only after that no. what should I do? Nowadays no. you have to do so. You have to go to an education center which is accepted by the board, Chamber, mm -hmm. for urological and uh, andrology and then you have to cover further 12 months. Mm -hmm. But six months are already inside the uh, normal training. So I I uh, cannot do the andrological procedures if I can, if I haven't this uh, certificate and not finished these courses, yes? No. So if you can do it, but you will not be paid for this. Ah. <laughs> so even uh, varicocele and circumcision, what... Uh, circumcision, no, no. But oh. if you are doing, a mac uh, for example, if you are doing diagnostics, ejaculate analysis, mm -hmm. you have to be trained and um, you uh, need a certification of your lab for this, endocrinology you need a certification and if you're duplex and sonography in Germany you need a certification and uh, the operation, sophisticated operation, for example for penile implants or varicocele, uh, they are a little bit tricky and if you have uh, complications always very bad not to be trained. You can do all the things without training. So, do you think that this uh, dividing uh, in the subspecialty, is it improve uh, quality of andrological care? Of course. So, when I, I started this in Germany, I wa you know, I was at the Council of the German Society and also president, and we initiated this subspeciality in 1995. And uh, the decision of the German chamber was in 2004, so we need uh, 10 years. 10 years. <laughs> so I know that you've been in Russia, uh, twice in Russia. So what is your impression of Russia and Russian medics and Russian urology? So first, Russia is very impressive for me. The men and the women are very friendly. And for me, it was always, a, I w had always a feeling of a very warm welcome. And I think we can, uh, improve our cooperation, especially in uh, medicine and urology and andrology. And this is uh, one of my goals for the future. And what recommendation could you give uh, to Russian uh, urologists to improve the andrological care? So what I think okay. the first thing is to have uh, education for andrology in Russia. I think it's not uh, not enough to send some guys as you are coming to a, such a congress, yeah. but you have to be trained continuously and I think the first is to create education centers in Russia mm -hmm. as we are planning it, for example, by the, University, uh, by the Institute of Urology in Moscow and, uh, and then you have to continue with this for years and after five, ten years I think you have established a good ideology. Okay, so we are finished. So okay, thank you very <laughs> thank much. Thank you very much indeed for these great uh, answers, and I think uh, many urologists will be interested in this interview.